And Seattle, you know, even though we're supposedly a major city, it's still small enough that we can still have direct, some direct democracy here, and people actually can show up at a city council meeting and pack the house with supporters on a particular um, issue. Uh, you can do that online now because on Tuesday I testified about the city's proposed ban on the use of the C CS gas and all that crazy stuff that they were using on protesters and the rubber bullets and flashbang grenades and stuff there's a a move on the city council by the city council to actually ban the use of these so-called crowd control devices on during protests um but there's a pushback from uh of course the police department um and so i had to address this issue that former police chief carmen best had raised which is she inferred that if you take away the the police's option to use uh, quote non-lethal quote uh, weapons that they their only alternative would be to use lethal weapons which and I pointed out an example on Martin Luther King Jr. Day uh, 15 people were arrested in Seattle um, by Seattle police and Washington State Patrol there was a an act of civil disobedience on Interstate 5 to try to uh, raise consciousness and focus on issues like racism and the prison industrial complex, police brutality. Um, and 15 people were arrested and, you know, lo and behold, no chemical weapons were used, no rubber bullets were used, no flashbang grenades were used to disperse the crowd. So that's one example of how, you know, police can actually... Um, open up I-5 again and actually arrest people without, you know, there being violent confrontations. But, you know, the there's it's a big controversy. The mayor has pushed back, even though Mayor Jenny Durkin supports some statewide legislation which would make it harder for police guilds and professional associations to uh, use the arbitration process during contract negotiations to block civil rights reforms. Um, although she does support that attempt by the state legislature, she uh, has sort of sided with the police on many issues, and one of them is the use of these, uh, the tear gas and these weapons. And, you know, in Seattle, we're all very, uh, unlike, well, like Portland, you know, it's, there, there's been, uh, the police have been very zealous about using chemical weapons here, and they've used so much that it's, you know, polluted entire parts of the city and put people's lives in danger who had nothing to do with any kind of, you know, disruption or protest. Not that that would justify it either, but they, you know, there's a pushback from the mayor, and then there's a consent decree that the police department is under because of a Department of Justice review, um, and that was based on uh, allegations of racial profiling and excessive use of force. Um... And I think if you if you talk to some folks who are on the street at a lot of these protests and see you know with their very own eyes somebody like you know our photojournalist um, Terence Winder he would tell you that you know a lot of the same uh, violent police tactics are still taking place and they may not be using the tear gas or as many of the crowd control weapons there's still a lot of brutal arrests taking place and there's also a problem of course with uh, Mike Sloan, the head of the Seattle Police Officers Guild, um, being associated with some pretty radical right-wing elements, you know, people who claim that the Black Lives Matter movement is, are terrorists. Um, and then you've got five off-duty Seattle police officers who participated in the uh, disruptions in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. So those are issues that, you know, are not commonly being covered by mainstream press in Seattle or elsewhere, but it's the kind of thing that uh, we should f be focused on, or I should be focused on, especially as a Seattle correspondent, and, you know, and I know Terrence is. So just, that was just to give you guys a heads up um, on a couple of things. I was, uh, another thing that happened today, for me today, is that Chuck 
Modiani, who's a pretty well-known journalist. He is, he's also a sports writer, but he's very political as well, and very outspoken uh, against fascism and, and right-wing uh, extremists. But he uh, quoted my t tweet today, and it had to do with um, the fact that we've kind of gotten to a point where it's, I think, uh, it's a reasonable statement to make that no self-respecting person would want to be a member of the Republican Party right now because of their association with white supremacist groups um, and extremists on the right. And then, you know, it's really important, I think, that people counter the extreme... Uh, not only some of the crazy conspiracy theories, but also the extreme um, uh, statements about the Democrats, because the leadership of the Re Republican Party is st still referring to um, the Democrats as radical leftists, you know, as if they're some kind of militant Marxist, you know, which is just way off base. And then, you know, I mean, they're corporatists. Give me a break. And then you've got... Um, yeah, so don't expect Joe Biden, you know, to bring about, bring about the revolution because, you know, these are corporate, these people are, are based on, the power is based as corporate interests. And there was a segment on Free Speech TV right after Tom Hartman's program today where one of those issues was addressed, which is um, just how the polls show that, you know, 70% of Americans do support universal health care and things like this. And and why those very democratic decisions are not reflected on our on the political level and you know that has to do with pharmaceutical money and um, you know the, the the control of the elections through com campaign contributions uh, the media is also the corporate media is also very much um, uh, a collaborator on this kind of thing um, and, and allows that to happen it enables these kind of false narratives to take place where, you know, the Republicans can fight um, things like universal health care as if there's some kind of majority against it, which there's not. Um, so just, and that's part of this is just for accuracy of journalism's sake too, that we all try to remember to deprogram ourselves <laughs> and what's going on in the country so that we can see clearly and report clearly what's actually happening, not what the current memes are or not what the the liberals or the conservatives at the moment claim is the frame we should be looking at reality through. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's there's an information war going on out there, and unfortunately, and this goes back to to one more thing before I ra then I'll wrap up is that the um, another book that I would recommend uh, or not a book actually an article, and I can post it on the support document. If somebody or somebody else can find it too pretty easily, I'm sure it's um, Tom Hartman's uh, article in The Nation magazine about two months ago, and he's basically re reiterating what I've been saying for a very long time, and it goes into, you know, why this organization needs fundraisers, you know, and, and consultants on that level or something to get us going, because um, unlike the right wing um, and folks like, you know, Fox and Sinclair Broadcasting and other others who have a, their political agenda the the progressives in in this country and more left leaning media has not done a good job and neither and neither have the the folks who have the money or you know potentially could raise that money they have not done a good job at helping to nurture uh independent media in this country so unfortunately you have uh, the corporate interests controlling the dialogue, and then that's reflected in the political parties as well. And I'll, I always remember, you know, when you go back to uh, what happened even on MSNBC and CNN, when uh, people could, you know, the the pundits, the political pundits, and the the anchor people just could not handle psychologically the idea that Bernie Sanders was the front runner in the Democratic primaries. They just could not wrap their minds around that. Some of them had complete meltdowns on on live <laughs> on the television because they couldn't handle it. And that just shows you where we're at in terms of the the political dialogue and the, the corporate controlled media dialogue. And that's why, you know, people don't even realize that 
oh, there's something called the Equal Rights Amendment? What's that? I mean, this is ridiculous. This has been around for how long? Well, first we got to get beyond this mindset, which is when uh, Mitch McConnell was asked about the Equal Rights Amendment, he said, the what? And then they said, the Equal Rights Amendment, it's, there's like one more state uh, will be enough to ratify it. And he says, uh, well, I'm not for it. You know, so that's where we have to we have to move way beyond that. What they did was they put a a um, a provision, a sunset clause into the preamble, but not into the language of the amendment. And so that has to be ruled on. And and the reason that that's dicey is because if preambles are have that kind of binding status, that opens up all kinds of possibilities when you look at the preamble to the Constitution, which seems to expand the application of things in the Constitution beyond the way they're usually interpreted. So I'm not sure the courts would want to interpret the preamble if they, unless they were forced to, because that, that's a dicey area for them. Because now you've got other preambles to other legislation. It's a can of worms. I don't... Traditionally, the court refuses can we sue the federal government because they have not created a more perfect union in our eyes? The model that's presented in corporate media, which is often you have uh, you have uh, an anchor person who represents father, right? The reassuring older guy. <laughs> and, and I guess the woman would be a motherly figure and you are you need to rely on them and be dependent on them every day for your news because they know what's good for you and what you need to know and you can trust them and to be reassured because the last story they did was really scary you know about some terrible car accident you know then the, you know you know they're going to give you the the cute little story about the kitten caught up in the tree towards the end of the show to calm you down again and it's it's all very much about manipulating the audience, you know, and there's a formula that they use over and over again. And regardless of whether the ownership of the station leans one way or another politically, they still use that same formula. And it's the local stations that I'm talking about. Um, now, they do do some good news, especially during times of, you know, natural disasters and things like that. It's very important what they do, and everybody recognizes that, but just in terms of their daily, nightly news broadcasts, I think they do have this formula um, where they want to scare you and then they want to reassure you, and that's kind of their game, so that you keep tuning back in again because they they want to scare you just enough so that you have to tune in tomorrow to make sure you haven't missed something terrible, <laughs> you know. And then, but they want to reassure you enough with their, you know, their hairspray and the five hundred dollar haircuts and thousand dollar suits or whatever and the makeup jobs. They want to reassure you that, no, everything's going to be okay, so you can still go shopping. So don't worry. Hey, Terrence. Got anything to report? From Seattle, from... I got your text about Mike Sloan and that whole issue. And the sweeps, which are continuing. One happening in Bellingham, actually. Uh, an hour or two ago. What do you know about it? So when you say sweep, what is your definition of the word sweep? Okay. It was a homeless camp. Yeah. yeah. Which is what Andrew Lewis was telling me he would not support in Seattle, and yet they continue to do it. Although there are places where... This is happening in Bellingham. Yeah, but it's also happened in Seattle. It happened. How many times has it happened in Cal Anderson Park now, the original site of the chop? I'm gonna guess four times. So, folks who aren't in Seattle, they, the mayor declared the chop zone, the Capitol Hill autonomous zone, off limits. Even as a journalist that wasn't allowed to enter the park for a while, a couple of days, she had an executive order. The Seattle City Council said it was illegitimate because she didn't even consult with them. And so they basically, they left a few things. They left uh, some of the the gardens that were created there and a little bit of the art, but they pretty much 
well, the cops came in and basically, you know, attacked the tents. They've done that multiple times. But there are parts of the city where there are people living where there has been no police activity whatsoever. And I think it's just because they're a little bit off the radar and there's no... Uh, res- nobody's complaining to the cops about it or something or calling the mayor's office. I don't know. I mean, you have this whole campaign by... Uh, Sinclair Broadcasting owned KOMO television in Seattle that's been pushing this kind of I hate Seattle campaign for a long time now and it's a very kind of uh, kind of leaning to the right sort of pro-business oriented anti-poor people kind of campaign where you know somebody's got to do something about Seattle because it's dying you know and um, it's all about these homeless people and heroin addicts and you know uh, you trying to create um, division in the community and this sort of fear of of poor people, which is a big problem in the United States. You know, being poor becomes a criminal act. It's like, hmm, especially when the system is kind of set up to make people poor. So, so it's no picnic, um, but there are people living in tents in parks and abandoned lots, and occasionally under bridges, uh, freeway overpasses, in wherever there's shelter from the rain is part of it um although there is one near aurora uh the old highway 99 the highway that used to go all the way down the west coast um it goes right through the middle of seattle as does interstate 5 um although they recently fixed uh interstate or highway 99 so it doesn't cut right through the center of the city like it used to because they built these tunnels that went on forever and and cost way too much money, kind of like the Boston Big Dig, but but now it's a lot more friendly to pedestrians in downtown Seattle. Highway 99 used to be, but that was a famous place for like road houses and you know bootlegging and prostitution and all sorts of stuff. But I don't know what's what it's like in Bergen County or Pittsburgh or Southern California or Salem these days, but I know in Seattle, homeless encampments are pretty much just de rigueur as the French would say they just they're, they're just normal they're everywhere and then every once in a while yeah the police go through and sweep and then they pop right back up of course because as Andrew Lewis said it's like if you don't provide housing for people then arresting them or destroying their property and confiscating their property really doesn't solve any of the problems if they're just trying to clear an area because there's a major convention coming like they did before the World Trade Organization conference in 1999 here, where they swept all the homeless people out of the city. Uh, you know, if they're trying to do it for the tourists, high place market in the summer, that's that's one tactic that they use as well, knowing that it won't solve the problem. They also do things like create parks that don't have much shelter and few trees and then benches that you can't really lay down on. Um, things like that to try to dissuade people from taking up residence. Um, so there's been a, a kind of an anti-homeless regime in Seattle for a long time, and KOMO television just seems to love to push that stuff. And I guess it's because they want to appeal to what they consider to be quote conservative unquote or quote right wing unquote audiences who are very. Uh, anti-progressive and anti-liberal you know who think that all of the problems in Seattle are because we have liberals in the government and well they would call them socialists or whatever uh, that we have a socialist city council and it's become a nanny state and you you can't get a plastic bag at the grocery store and you know (laughs) like that's your major problem for the day but uh, I don't know Um, there's a big tax on sugary drinks to help you know, try to build affordable housing. The problem is, is that no matter how much money is donated, and no matter how much money the city keeps saying that it's going to spend on affordable housing, it never does quite keep up with the demand. And so, it's a this like this never-ending story because they keep building huge high rises and causing the cost of real estate to go so high in the city that nobody can afford the rent unless you have a professional job, and then you settle for, like, a New York-style kind of apartment now where it's, like, tiny and you think it's great, you know? Or when I first moved to Seattle, you could get a really nice, spacious one-bedroom, and it'd be, you know, or maybe even two bedrooms for a relatively 
decent price now. It's like people are happy with their little closets that they, they call micro units or whatever that they pay, you know, $1,000 a month for or something. And so, yeah, there's how do you sustain a population when people can't afford the rents? Um, minimum wage certainly hasn't kept up with the cost of living. Um, and then you have these so-called progressives in your government who never seem to actually do what they say they're going to do. They run on all sorts of promises about... Jenny Durkin ran on the campaign. I interviewed her. Oh, my God. I heard her say right there in front of my face on camera, uh, Seattle is a place where every person has a right to have a place to live. Unless you're in in a park and they sweep you with the police and confiscate your tent, then I guess you don't. Um, back in the there was this historical precedent to back in the depression with the Nicholsvilles well they call them Hoovervilles we call them Nicholsville we call it the major one in Seattle is called Nicholsville and it's named after a former mayor who kind of sided with the developers but uh, in the past this was an issue to uh, there were Hoovervilles all over the United States during the Great Depression and basically you know uh a bunch of social programs were created to try to alleviate that and give people relief which is pretty much what people need now and then there was also the in, the uh, the industrial march on Washington DC that happened around the same time that they had a major market crash and banks were failing everywhere because people had over speculated in the railroad market um, they marched on Washington DC you know and and some of them were veterans from the Civil War demanding the pensions and th stuff that they had been promised that they never got. And that also happened during the Great Depression where there was a huge city uh, built in Washington, D.C. that was then raided by the U.S. military. What happened? The U.S. military came after them with weapons and killed a few people and confiscated their tents and chased them out of Washington, D.C. So the I the the one of the weaknesses of capitalism, I guess, is that there's a sweep it under the rug kind of mentality about poverty, and people try to claim. And the, the thing that's mind blowing to me is that I hear people calling in, even to somebody like Tom Hartman's program, and they'll say, and they're a conservative or something, and they'll say, um, "Well, fifteen dollars an hour is way too much for minimum wage," <clears throat> and can go into details of you know what the business model is and you know whether it's a small business or a major corporation like McDonald's that can afford that um, and whether even fifteen dollars um, an hour minimum wage would I mean that's poverty in Seattle so um, but they usually come back with this argument that uh, people should not have too much money like there's something wrong with a person who works at a restaurant having money like I guess people only get to have money if they're doctors lawyers politicians businessmen there are certain classes of people that I guess get to have money but people who uh, work at a restaurant do not deserve to make fifteen dollars an hour because that's too much money so there's almost this attitude that no people should be poor and so-called unskilled unquote labor is what they used to call it like farm workers that's why Cesar Chavez came along and started organizing because they didn't get covered by any minimum wage laws and even in Washington State when I was a kid farm workers got way way low the lowest minimum wage possible so I was proposing writing a short story that would be kind of satirical and it would be this uh, this society that was formed out in the middle of nowhere that was very isolated and when the explorers find it they realize that it's actually the people who do the hardest work that make the most money so the agricultural workers and the people who build the buildings you know and take out the trash or whatever they they make a lot of money because it's hard work and then the people who get to sit around and have a lot of business meetings and go to champagne brunches they don't make as much they're you know because they're not considered as important <laughs> yeah, but I like the idea that, you know, people should be rewarded for hard work. Um, uh, it's just the idea that, like, people who do manual labor don't have skills or something, you know. 
I think uh, just this idea that people have been taught through corporate media and political parties or whatever that um, some people deserve to be poor and that's just the way it is and, and it's not right for certain people to make a lot of money it's just not right and then you go well why it's we're not asking you to pay more taxes to increase their minimum wage it's going to come from the corporation or whatever right but they still don't think it's right because no you shouldn't charge a multinational billion dollar corporation you shouldn't make them pay their workers enough to where they actually make a decent living that's not right business community value the corporation over the people and the priorities are to disenfranchise the people with financial resources that's one way so then your worker at McDonald's or what, wherever where they meet real people every day uh, can't get a, a wild hair and start to form an organization to advocate for change I mean, if you're impoverished, you can't do that because you're always working. Thank you, Mark. Well, that would be, I guess, almost, unfortunately, human nature in all every society that's ever been created, as far as I can tell. Unless there, you know, maybe not. There have been some pretty close to ideal situations at certain times. But in terms of whether it's capitalism or communism or anything else, you know, it, or whether it's the Romans or the... Sumerians or the the Europeans, it all tends to come down to people who have power like to hold on to it and they like to increase it, and people who don't would like a little bit. <laughs> Usually not even a lot, just a little bit. <laughs> and those are the, you know, so we've had institutions that were supposed to address that, and one would be maybe religion, you know, but then that leads to its own corruption, and then there's uh, you know, the press at times has been, um, commission to deal with that um, and try to right some of the wrongs and create more equity and it's always the political rhetoric that we always hear from our leaders in the United States is about this equity issue and how we're going to create a more equitable society what were they saying during the inauguration a more perfect union you know where where we actually live up to those promises that we haven't lived up to before about people being equal so yeah, you can see it from a very philosophical point of view that it happens in every society, but if you want to analyze it like a, like a uh, journalistic project or an accommodation, you would want to look for the mechanisms within that society that perpetuate that and allow that to happen. And you would have to point to political parties and the media, for sure, in this country um, as helping perpetuate that that there are certain expectations of what a person's life should be like there are and this is what gets on my nerves a lot because you know I I also work in the entertainment industry in the artistic community so there's a celebrity worship thing that is really really out of balance too in this country that just drives me crazy because you have a lot of really talented geniuses who get no credit whatsoever and no exposure for their work and no support and no audience because somebody else has already won three Grammy Awards and everybody wants to go listen to them and buy their records, you know, instead of somebody who's up and coming. And you have the entire media and corporate world and entertainment industry geared towards celebrating Elton John. Not not that there's anything wrong with Elton John. I love Elton John, but I mean, there are a lot of up and coming artists who are really great um, that don't get any support, but Elton John will always get corporate support for whatever he does because he's Elton John and so there's this hierarchy in the entertainment world and the arts world too where un sometimes undeserving artists you know get the most favor and that's not something that I think is healthy for society either um, because it disempowers people who are very talented and have a lot to offer society um so we've been a little bit more successful at times in Seattle of, of trying to push back against that. That's why it's considered an anti-rock star kind of town, which can have its own problems because, you know, like when you eat your own or whatever, like the left is often, con you know, accused of eating its own or whatever. Um, when you When you don't celebrate people's talent because they're popular, just because they're popular, that's also a problem, you know, because some people deserve some of the attention they get, you know. And in Seattle, there is kind of a pushback where, like, once you 
you know, like Macklemore here is considered kind of a sellout, that kind of thing. You know, once you win a Grammy award, nobody wants to, <laughs> nobody talks about you in the same way anymore, or something. I don't know. <laughs> and but I guess that's better than L.A., where you know, everything is hype, 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 and everybody's always lying about how great something is when it's not. Um, here, the, you know, you have to work really, really hard to get attention. Uh, there's also back to what we were talking about before. There's a line in the the play 1776 that was written by a, a history teacher, where the Southern delegate to the Continental Congress says to Thomas Jefferson, "Remember, Mr. Jefferson, they will always follow us to the right because people will always and would much prefer to protect the possibility of becoming rich than ever accept the reality that they are poor. That's why they will follow us to the right." So you have this idea that someday I'm going to be Donald Trump and so I want him to be able to have the same kind of things that I would want if I were Donald Trump or, or the emperor I mean in a lot of ways if you look at his regime his reign if you want to call it whatever it actually had a lot in common with and a lot of corollaries with some kind of outrageous Roman emperors he wasn't quite as outrageous you know as some of those emperors thank God but um the attitudes were very similar in a lot of ways in the way that he ruled just that you know uh, people must obey me because of who I am that um, I can never be wrong because I am the emperor and um, anybody who opposes me shall be uh, taken care of let's put it that way <laughs> one way or another like uh and if I don't like what's going on, then I'm going to throw a tantrum and start destroying things, you know. So that was my joke about a new blockbuster movie called Nero starring Donald Trump. He's playing golf while the Capitol burns. And he's like, oh, no, they're fine people on both sides. By the way, I'm looking at a book. You are talking about the potential book list. And I, I would recommend anybody who has a recommendation for a book list for potential journalists for Democracy Watch News or people who follow our stuff um, maybe we can set up a way of submitting those ideas um, I know you you have at least one you want to put on the list Dean I had the William Greider book I thought that was a pretty good one and right now I'm looking at this book that I believe by Douglas Miller, I believe he was the former American ambassador to Germany, called You Can't Do Business with Hitler. My comment was going to be that it it's interesting, during the age, maybe during the McCarthy era, although, although that kind of started to get edgy too, when he started attacking the U.S. military, but... Um, Say during the Nixon era, the silent majority, you know, that Nixon was always talking about, um, when he was saying, I am not a crook, um, they were supposedly the conservatives in the country who were middle of the road people who were kind of scared of the hippies and the drugs and stuff, and they wanted a more 50s style society, and which the 50s was always like people's mental conception of what the good conservative America was, which is not true, but that's another story for another day. People who had really loved Ronald Reagan and were very, considered themselves patriotic, were pro-military, maybe Republican, you know, and, and the attitude then was uh, to be conservative see if I'm presenting this correctly, but to be conservative was to be for the status quo, was to be for the institutions that exist, right? So you would be preserving the union of the United States, you'd be preserving uh, the country, whereas this right-wing movement is a different thing where it has co-opted some of the conservative movement, but it's no longer... Uh, our job is to protect these institutions it's now our job is to destroy these institutions which is a totally different thing and that is much more akin to outright militancy and guerrilla warfare tactics and things like that it's more like a, a almost a de undeclared war and so the problem that I see is 
and this may be some of the things, same things that Douglas Miller was trying to tell people, is that when that becomes normalized, when when actually conservative goes from being for something to being against everything, then that's a totally different picture. And if and it's okay, so it's one thing to have people who are trying to gain access to power, who literally think don't mind killing other people, um, hate immigrants, and you know, or just downright nasty people. When those people, you know, are trying to gain power, that's scary, right? It is, and you have to you have to call it out and you have to confront it. But if they actually do gain power, I mean, and that was the whole lesson of of what happened with fascism is that it's one thing to be a small group of people or even kind of co-opt a political party and take it in a weird direction or whatever. It's another thing if you actually are able to use your intimidation tactics and your bullying and violence to obtain the power and then hold on to it. Then there is no accountability whatsoever and that's the thing that we really have to guard against. We have to guard ourselves against that because if they do, if they actually are able to to gain the reins of power, well, we've seen what they're capable of doing, and that's why I think we need to be really on guard. We've already seen how some. Uh, rabid right-wing anti-communists and racists were in control of the FBI. Do you really want those kind of people in control of all of your institutions? So it's one thing to have a wannabe dictator who cries and moans because he doesn't get his way and tries to act out and disrupt everything. It's another thing to have somebody like that who actually has the reins of power and actually does become dictatorial because they don't know when to stop and they're, they're, the ego maniacal part of their personality is so self-destructive that I mean you don't want that you do not want to I'm sorry to inform you all but um, the new right wing uh, regime has outlawed Democracy Watch News you're not allowed to post anything you will be arrested and held Trump would love to do that.